Research is unlocking the previously underappreciated relationship between the conscious and unconscious brain. Tonight's contribution to our Mysteries of the Mind series is peering into the unconscious brain. And here now to set the stage for what we'll be seeing tonight, Dr. Norman Deutsch, psychiatrist and author of The Brain That Changes Itself. And welcome back. Good to see you again. Thank you. Why are we talking about the unconscious brain tonight? Because brain science studies using all sorts of brain scans are showing that whenever we investigate aspects of thought, uh, perception, motivation, emotion, we're finding that more and more of it is going on unconsciously behind our awareness. It's as simple as that. And the more we investigate things, the more we're finding things are actually unconscious as opposed to conscious in terms of the processing that's creating our mental life. Just to be clear, when you say the unconscious brain, you're not referring to, for example, a patient in a coma. No. What are you referring I to? I mean, something that's going on that's a mental activity that's outside of our awareness. What has been the conventional view of the abilities of this unconscious brain? Well, the conventional view was there, there's no unconscious mind. Uh, it, it, the conventional view makes a kind of uh, common sense. It's a, it's a common sense view, and this, the definition of mental for thousands of years were, were these experiences that we have that we're subjectively aware of. And it was really only at the, uh, at the end of the, uh, of the 19th century that people started to put together a picture that there might be a certain kind of processing that's outside our awareness. We've all had the experience of saying we're going to sleep on a problem and just sort of put it away for the night and wake up in the morning and things are clear. But the discovery of, of hypnosis, which goes back about three or four hundred years in, in modern times, um, was one of the things that uh, led a lot of the major 19th century neurologists, psychiatrists, and of course Freud to reflect that there was thinking going on behind the scenes. And because you could take a person, put them into a trance, give them a suggestion that they will have a new interest mm -hmm. or do something, and also tell them they'll forget about that. Uh, and you could do that. And you can do that. Mm -hmm. So this gave rise, of course, to uh, Freud's thought and his, his emphasis, which made the unconscious really a, a term that many people knew, and it gave rise to a new therapy. But it was always kind of controversial in the sense that um, it's hard enough to, to measure a thought. We can't really measure thoughts. Now, imagine you're trying to measure and demonstrate something that's an unconscious thought. But, but we have the technology to do that, right? You hook well, people up to machines and you can see what's going on in the brain what unconsciously. What we do is we're almost there in the sense that we know, we know now how to view what's going on in the brain when we are having a thought. That's a correlation. So this area of the brain is firing with this kind of mental activity. We, we've shown that thousands of times. But we've also been able to show that for instance, when we're making a decision, before we've even made the decision, the brain has already performed some of that operation. Hmm. And um, so what's happening is we have this ability now to begin tracking what's going on in the brain and what's going on in the person's mind at the same time. And to begin to differentiate what seems to be going on when we're consciously aware of our thoughts and what's going on when we're in altered states, like dreaming or hypnosis and this kind of thing. So it's really very, very exciting because uh, for the first time we're, we're, we have studies, for instance, that show how psychoanalytic psychotherapy works. Uh, Anna Buchheim has just come out with a study about a year ago. It's a German, Austrian, American study that shows what's going on in the mind of depressed patients when they get psychoanalytic therapy and they're getting better. And interestingly, some of the same areas uh, are firing and change, are changing how they fire as occurs when people uh, use something called deep brain stimulation to turn off depression um, or, or medication. So Let's not take someone suffering from depression. Let's just take an average everyday person. Is it fair to say that once upon a time the assumption was there's a lot of dark 
thoughts happening in the unconscious mind? And if so, are you lightening up a little bit these days? Um, if you know what I mean. It's, I think I know what you mean. And look, Freud said that in the unconscious, there were uh, aspects of our instinctual life. Um, he anticipated this kind of processing that I've been talking about, just the general behind the scenes processing that's going on to produce our mental life. But he also discovered, working with patients, that things we don't like to think about ourselves, uh, feelings that are very powerful that overwhelm us that we'd rather not face, somehow or other can be suppressed. And you can have things like unconscious anger, unconscious rage. And that was controversial because it seems like it's an oxymoron. It seems that rage would be conscious. Mm -hmm. um, but we've, we now realize that our emotional lives actually can be split up the way he described. That was a very, very rich line of inquiry, and it's helped a lot of people. But there's another approach to it that was developed by a very brilliant hypnotist named Milton Erickson. Um, Milton Erickson was, a, um, as a boy, he had polio and was in constant pain. And he taught himself to go into trance to deal with pain. Hmm. And he began with his patients. He was a psychiatrist. From where? Uh, from the United States. Okay to focus on things that they had in the unconscious, which we might call resources, things that would help them solve their problems, and use trance to bring these things to the surface. And a whole school developed out of that. So that's, you might say, more unconscious friendly. Freud always thought that creativity came from the unconscious. But the focus of the analytic approach was to remove the barriers to that creativity coming up and it assumed that it would come up by itself. The hypnotic approach following Erickson was to use the hypnotic trance to facilitate the person getting at that. And they've had some remarkable results, too. So um, now we're getting uh, to, uh, to a situation where we can try to enhance our mental functioning by using the conscious mind and putting a person into a trance to get access to the unconscious that way. And then, of course, with the help of brain scans, we're trying to figure out what, is, what separates consciousness, conscious thought from unconscious thought. Is it on a continuum? Or is there a gate? And if there's a, if there's a gate or a door, who's got the keys? And how can we turn the keys if we want to turn them, if there are these wonderful resources there? That's another great setup for what we hope will be another great program. Dr. Deutsch, thanks so much. And we'll continue to see you throughout the week. Great. Up next, we'll expand our discussion further and uncover new views of the unconscious right after this. Far beyond your conscious awareness lies a whole series of capabilities that we are unaware we possess. Joining us now to tell us more about what a new understanding of this resource could deliver, in Phoenix, Arizona, Bill O'Hanlon. He's a psych psychotherapist and author most recently of The Change Your Life Book. In New York, New York, Heather Berlin, cognitive neuroscientist and professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. In our nation's capital, Georg Northoff, Canada Research Chair in Mind, Brain Imaging and Neuroethics at the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Center and University of Ottawa, and the author of the two-volume, Unlocking the Brain. And with us here in studio, Jacques Gauss, a clinical psychologist in Hamilton and past president of the Canadian Society of Clinical Hypnosis. And we welcome all four of you to our program tonight for a discussion about something that I suspect we think very little about, but which we want to find out a lot more about over the course of the remainder of our hour. Dr. Heather Berlin, why don't you get us started on that? Uh, mental activity outside awareness is what Norman Doidge says. Uh, what do you say? Well, I think defining the unconscious is very difficult, just as it is to define consciousness. I mean, with consciousness, all we can say is it's first-person subjective experience. And unconscious is everything that happens in the brain outside of awareness. So you can have the unconscious, which is meaningless. You can have meaningful unconscious, which goes on to affect behavior. And you can have the emotive unconscious, or what we could call the classic psycho 
analytical, psychodynamic unconscious, which goes on to motivate us in terms of our behavior and the way we interact with the world. Dr. Georg Nortov, what would you add to that? I would add that it is spontaneous and automatic. Spontaneous meaning we cannot avoid it. It goes con continuously on by itself and it's automatic. It, basically, there are certain mechanisms and principles that occur by default on the psychological level as well as most likely on the neuronal level. And Dr. Gauss, would and you want you to add anything to that? Yes, I would certainly say from the clinical perspective, I think sometimes we, we get confused. I see that with my patients when we talk about conscious and unconscious. I think it's more a continuum of, of where we need to be in awareness. It's a focus, such as, you know, when, when my tummy is hungry, it tells me it's hungry. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm not aware of it uh, because I'm busy with other things. But the tummy becomes very important when I'm hungry because it tells me I need, I need some nutrition. Otherwise, I'm not going to continue to function. And I think in that context, it's a little bit uh, different from what our, our colleagues are saying here, just from the pure uh, scientific perspective. Let's give a sort of a hard and fast example here. Dr. Berlin, to you first. And tell me if we've sort of got things figured out here. If you're driving your car home from work, you get home. You don't actually remember anything about the drive on the way home, because let's say you were listening to the radio and you were very deeply involved in whatever, the song you were listening to on the radio. Did your unconscious drive you home? Well, I think much of what we do in, in, in throughout the day is being driven, so to speak, by the unconscious. Because if you think about it, um, to be consciously aware of something, it takes a lot of, um, let's call it energy and it's capacity limited. So if you had to be consciously aware of all of the stimuli in your environment throughout the day, it would be overwhelming and it would be maladaptive. So a really great uh, sort of um, conclusion of evolution is that much of how we interact the world must go on. It's being processed by the brain, but outside of conscious awareness because the unconscious has a greater uh, capacity to hold information. So we're only aware, as you know, it's been said many times before, of the very, just the tip of the iceberg. And much of what we do when you're navigating the streets of New York, um, walking, doing very complex tasks, much of it is way outside of awareness. And if it was in your conscious awareness, it actually would mess the behavior up. You wouldn't be able to do it as, as efficiently. And Dr. Nordhoff, help us understand why it's important to appreciate the distinction between what you consciously do and what you unconsciously do. Why does it matter? Let me come back to your driving home example. I think if you just bought the, the house new and you don't know your way home yet, then you will have to recruit your consciousness. Then you will not be able just to drive home while listening music. If you have that home since 15 years and you know basically the way home by heart, then you can almost drive by unconscious. And that means that your unconscious encodes and somehow ingrains in certain patterns of information. And ultimately the distinction, uh, coming back to the clinical example, between conscious and unconscious is really a matter of degree. Um, it's not a pure all or nothing dichotomy as Freud originally envisioned, but probably just a matter of degree, uh, stronger conscious or a little bit more unconscious. And that, I think, is the way also what you can see in clinical psychiatry. In which case, Dr. Gauss, does that mean, let's say you've lived in this house for 15 years and you can pretty much let your unconscious drive you all the way home because you know the way. Does that mean if our unconscious performs some of those functions in our life, it frees up, if you like, space for our conscious to do more and better things? Oh, absolutely, because it's like being on autopilot in one area while we are paying attention in another area. Um, it, it's almost like, you know, having your uh, GPS in your car. You're unaware of the satellites that are up there that are guiding you, uh, so you can pay your full attention to what the GPS is telling you what to do, while in the back office, if we could call it that, the satellites are keeping the GPS on track. So it makes sense, Dr. Berlin, to, to really make a distinction between what the conscious and the unconscious do then. Is that fair to say? 
Well, again, I think there it's not black and white. There's sort of a gray area between conscious and unconscious processing. And I think the more we understand about it at the neural level, the more we can make better distinctions between the two. But for now, it's just the subjective state. You simply ask a person, were you aware or were you not aware? And sometimes it's very gray. And uh, sometimes it has to do with signal detection. You know, what percentage of a chance that the person will be aware of detecting something in their environment? Uh, so it's really hard to separate them into very distinct uh, bins, so to speak. Understood. I should just let everybody know, I'm not ignoring Bill O'Hanlon here. We're having a problem with his microphone out of Arizona. Uh, we're working on that, and uh, Bill, as soon as we get that fixed, obviously we'll have you in the discussion here. Our apologies in the, uh, in the interim. We hear a lot, and uh, Georg, let me go to you on this. We hear a lot these days about you know, these very sophisticated fMRIs, which do brain imaging and map out all sorts of things about the brain. When you do that, does that include the unconscious brain? I think any kind of uh, neuronal activity we observe in fMRI, like the colorful dots and spots, which are often shown, always include a certain uh, portion of unconscious activity. Uh, we cannot avoid it. I mean, exactly as my colleague said, any kind of conscious activity builds upon the unconscious and somehow interacts with this automatic uh, ongoing processing in the background. So in the same way, you're, when you look on your GPS, you cannot avoid that all the satellites pick up all the information, because this is basically the very basis for any kind of signal you're watching by full awareness in the GPS. And that's the same way what happens in the brain. What we observe is probably a very crude mixture between conscious and unconscious activity. And the, the good scientists, and we are trying to work on this, is trying to experimentally distinguish the two. But probably from the perspective of the brain, we always have sort of a mixture between the two. Hmm. As I said, there's probably a neuronal continuum between the two. Bill O'Hanlon, uh, thank you for your patience. I think we've got things fixed now. You've heard us uh, discussing yeah. a number of different things. So why don't you just pick up on something you've heard and continue? Well, I think that, you know, I, I, I think maybe a better word for what we're talking about is non-conscious. You know, unconscious gets confused with you're knocked out. So I think that's first, maybe a little change in terminology. And there is a certain kind of non-conscious awareness that we have when we're asleep. We don't roll off the bed. We figure out where the edges of the bed are. But where the, I think what Dr. Deutsch was talking about in our introduction is that there's a shifting uh, view of this non-conscious material, and that is what, what some of the other panelists were talking about. It can either be helpful, like driving you home automatically and you paid attention to the other traffic, or it can be unhelpful. And so there are automatic patterns, I think that's been mentioned before, but some of those automatic patterns are helpful and some aren't. And I'll just give a quick example, if I may. That is, I had a friend who is a physician, quite, you know, functional, and she went to take piano lessons, and it turned out that her mother had taught her piano when she was younger, and whenever she made a mistake, her mother would slap her on the head quite hard. And so she stopped taking piano lessons from her mother. She hated it. But 50 years later, she's 59 years old, and she goes to take piano lessons, and the piano teacher can't teach her after a while because she keeps flinching every time she makes a mistake. Huh. Even though she knows where it came from, that pattern is automatic and it's not very easily changeable and she's using it in a context in which it doesn't work. That's a little different from what Dr. Deutsch was talking about. Because we have some of these non-conscious patterns automatic, we can use them. For example, I wear glasses, but I don't notice that I have my glasses on my face after the first day or two after I get a new pair of glasses. And that I use with hypnosis, as I'm sure Jacques does, mm -hmm. to help people remove their awareness of pain, we have that as an ability to not notice something when it's there all the time. And so it's the functional non-conscious automaticity versus the dysfunctional or non-functional. Let me do a quick follow-up with you on that, Bill O'Hanlon, and that is it, it, it seems a bit frightening that 50 years later, that kind of non-conscious reaction would still be deep inside somebody uh, only to come out a half a century later. Presumably, you can yes. do something about yes. that. Well, yes, that's, that's the clinical part of this, and that's, again, what we who use hypnosis, who use psychotherapy, uh, what Dr. Deutsch does with his uh, psychodynamics or psychoanalytic therapy, we're trying to get people 
to kind of rewire those automatic patterns so they no longer happen in inappropriate contexts. And so the resources from the unconscious, the abilities that are needed also come forward. So we're doing a sort of an internal rewiring job. And that's what this whole week is about, I think, because you're talking about how the brain can change, how it's plastic, how it's changeable. But how you do that is, that's the rub. There's the rub. Okay, let me go to Jacques Gauss on this then, because Heather and Georg come from a medical and sort of neuroscientific background. You and Bill are from a more psychoanalytic tradition, and I wonder if both traditions see a new understanding of the non-conscious emerging. Oh, absolutely. Uh, they and, both and, do. Absolutely, and I think, you know, we, we tend to sometimes split uh, and, and I want to I want to say it this way: we sometimes tend to split art and science, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really the same thing. In the same way that we split mind and body, and it's the same thing. Uh, what we need to understand is that in the deepest parts of the brain, uh, it's really wired for our survival. And I like to explain that to people in that way when I work with them, and, and I think Bill uh, does the same, where we explain that you know that's the survival, the survival part of the brain. And its job is to make sure that as an organism, we survive. But because we have developed evolutionary as we are, we have the frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes are, are you know, our executive, where we see things, experience things, where we decide about appropriate behavior, not appropriate behavior. And, and what uh, I, I'm sure Bill does the same that I do, we actually work backwards. Because the survival initially directs behavior through the executive. But by working back through the executive, we can go to the survival and say, well, you know, at that time it was a necessary survival action, but it's not necessary anymore. And uh, so we can change the, be the behavior response that goes back into the uh, old survival uh, mechanisms. Uh, and I think a lot of what we see in the neuroscience that comes out today is exactly that. That, you know, we can, and that's the plasticity of the brain, that we can change the neural networks so that it is a uh, situation appropriate response rather than a, a situation inappropriate response, which is where we see the, the mental health problems. Let me put the same question to Heather Berlin, and that is, again, given the two distinctions here in traditions and backgrounds, uh, medical and neuroscientific versus psychoanalytic, do you think they are in, I don't know what the right word is here, are they in competition, are they in contrast, are they, are they some in collaboration with each other? How would you view it? Well, I think actually it's a really exciting time given the technology we have now that allows us to peer, really peer into the brain and see its workings. But it's important to remember that Freud was actually a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. And he ultimately believed that everything he was talking about, the science of the mind and the unconscious, was instantiated in the brain. They just didn't have the tools and technology to be able to understand how they were related at the time. But I think with the advances we're having, such as things like neuroimaging, um, being able to record from single cells in, human, um, in the human brain while they're awake during surgery, things like optogenetics, we can really go in and even start to manipulate the brain rather than going just looking at the correlation between brain activation and cognition. We can actually get into causation by implanting electrodes, things like deep brain stimulation. Um, so it's a really exciting time. And the merge, there's actually a, a field which has emerged called neuropsychoanalysis which is really trying to understand the relationship between the neural basis of the brain and psychoanalytic theory. And for, you know, touching on what um, some other people have been talking about, you know, this evolutionarily older part of the brain, uh, which is driving us and these, these sort of instincts driving us forward, what Freud might have called the id, uh, is competing with the sort of more evolutionary newer part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, what, what if you wanted to put it in psychoanalytic terms could be called the superego. And these two brain systems um, competing with each other or interacting with each other um, forms this dynamic. So again, we can start mapping on the language of neuroscience to the language of psychoanalytic theory. And I think that they're ultimately compatible because you can't just talk about the mind without talking about the brain and you can't talk about the brain without talking about the mind. So they need to come together somehow. Hmm. Okay, having said that, uh, Georg, can you give us a sense about, and it might be helpful to our viewers if we put a fraction on it, how much of what goes on in the brain is the non-conscious versus the conscious? Is it possible to put a, a fraction or a percentage on it? Oh, that's a difficult question. But however, I mean, um, there is in the brain a spontaneous activity, and it's called sort of paradoxically resting state activity. But this activity is highly... 
uh, highly active, it continu continuously changes, has a lot of spontaneous spatial and temporal pattern changes. And these are spontaneous. And it seems that these patterns uh, encode certain information from the environment. It is something, and there's a lot of energy in that. So that relates you back to the old term of psychic energy or catexis, as Freud described. And I use that term sort of to bridge the gap from the level of the mind, from the psychological levels, Freud described very, Freud described very nicely, back to the brain and see what Freud called uh, psychic energy is in truth uh, neuronal and metabolic energy provided by the brain and the body. And that uh, induces a lot of spontaneous changes. I discussed it a lot in my book on neuropsychoanalysis in 2011. And I do think that uh, the spontaneous activity provides a link from the neuronal side and the concept of psychic energy provides a link from the psychological point of view. And now when I see in my psychotic patients whom I treat, uh, I see a lot of, exactly as one of my colleagues said before, that sort of the psychic energy is uh, structured in a wrong way. I mean, the example with the pianist, 50 years later, the old trauma that come up. So it tells you that the psychic energy and probably in some yet unclear way, the neuronal energy of the spontaneous activity of the brain does encode some of these informations which are particularly relevant to the person, self-related or personally relevant information. Bill, it's possible there, there may not be a simple answer to this question, even though I'm desperate to find a simple answer to this question, but can you do anything for right. us on that percentage of what percentage of the brain is conscious versus non-conscious activity? No, I think why it's difficult to answer that question is, as other people have said, it's a fluid thing. For example, if I ask you right now to become conscious of your left ear, all of a sudden that would move into consciousness, although it's mostly non-conscious, and you're not attending to your left ear. So I think that's why a percentage is hard. You know, there are all these things. You're only using 10% of your brain. I think those are rough estimates, these kind of things. But I think back to the point that you made earlier about how do you change this stuff, I think that one of the challenges in the analytic tradition, the Freudian tradition, you're trying to make the conscious, the unconscious or the non-conscious conscious so that you can have access to it and change it. But as I gave the example with my friend who was very conscious of where that trauma came from and where the flinching came from, it's not always it doesn't always work just to be conscious of it. So mm -hmm. there's a different tradition. And again, that's what uh, Dr. Deutsch was talking about in the, in the introductory uh, moments that you had with him. And that is, there's a different tradition of keeping things at the non-conscious level, but rewiring and changing things. And medications can certainly do that. People do not become conscious when we change their neurology with medications or with electroshock therapy or electroconvulsive therapy. And there's a hypnotic tradition that Jacques and I uh, usually work with, and that is helping people change at the non-conscious level without it ever becoming conscious. Hmm. And there's an analytic s s hypnotic tradition that says, let's make it conscious from using hypnosis, but I have a different tradition that says, let's just change it at that level and leave it under the hood. We don't need to get it out and hmm. show you how an engine works. We just need to fix the engine. Gotcha. Let's take uh, the first of what I hope will be a couple of pauses just for the moment to play uh, a clip from, because of course we're blanketing prime time this week on TVO with the documentaries and this program as well, all dealing with mysteries of the mind. And here's a clip from a documentary. It's a series we're going to be airing tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, this one from The Automatic Brain. Let's play this clip and then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. The really important decisions, for example, should I should I be with so-and-so woman? And you write down the reasons why you should be with her. And you write down the reasons why you should not be with her. And they're very long. <laughs> and of course, you choose to be with her. And who's in charge here? I claim it's the unconscious mind. Consciousness is almost like an afterthought. I mean, some argue we don't even have it just kind of a PR exercise in the brain of letting you think you're involved. Dr. Berlin, you want to call it a PR exercise, the conscious mind? 
Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I call it that. I mean, the conscious mind could be actually deceiving, right? Um, mm -hmm. We can fabulate a lot. Much of, as I said, our behavior is being motivated by things outside of awareness. And we come up with these post hoc explanations of why we're um, behaving in certain ways, which might not actually be related to the truth. So. Um, yeah, I mean, in a sense, it's it's making up a story or a narrative of your life that is maybe more acceptable uh, than perhaps examining the real reasons. Uh, and also, keeping I, I, I wanted to say that keeping things outside of awareness is, is adaptive, even traumatic memories, um, because if they were constantly intruding, like in things like PD, PTSD, it becomes very maladaptive. So it's a good thing to keep certain traumatic experiences outside of awareness uh, and, and only allow them to enter consciousness if somehow they're going to, to be helpful. However, on the, con uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, if something is constantly um, a, a negative thought or experience is in the back of your mind that's constantly affecting your behavior, and the only way to go in to change it is to bring it to consciousness, then it becomes better to bring it out. But as, as you know, the, um, the, the doctor was saying before, sometimes if you can go in and change things in the unconscious without ever becoming aware of it, that would probably be the best solution. So does the non-conscious mind, Dr. Gauss, make decisions for us without even consulting us, if you know what I mean? Well, you know, and, and I think this is where we're getting into a really interesting part. If it was just cognitive, if it was just thinking, it would be fine because we could rationalize around that. We can use logic. What complicates the picture is this thing called emotion. And emotion is, uh, is, is another area that really doesn't make much sense if we look at it from a, a purely neurocognitive perspective, uh, which is why we have cognitive behavioral therapy that says, you know, this, is, this, is not, uh, this doesn't make sense to have this kind of emotional reaction to something that isn't logical at this stage in life, if I use Bill's example of the friend. The reality is actually that, you know, it, it's like a black box running in the background. It records everything that happens, and when it's needed, it comes back as a warning. And with that comes the emotional experience mm. we had. And that is what complicates it so much. And that is why I think people have their own truths that seem to be totally different from what uh, uh, other objective observers have seen. But of course, Bill O'Hanlon, that black box just referred to if you're flying a plane, you never think about it. You don't even know, I mean, you, you probably don't even know it's there because you've got your mind on other things. So what is the bulk of the work in our minds that that black box or the non-conscious actually does? It, it helps us to do all those automatic things that we usually do. And as was said before, as Jacques and other people said, it helps us survive. That's the good news, except why we have psychotherapy and why we have this whole week of programs is that the mind often does illogical, irrational, and unhelpful things that undermines us. We self-sabotage. We keep getting in the same kind of problems. We keep, I, I, I used to work in a drug and alcohol treatment center and there was a woman there and she said, I grew up in an alcoholic family. And she said, I married five alcoholics. Hmm. And she said, what was, what was more extraordinary is one of them didn't even drink when I got to know him. <laughs> I thought, boy, that's, that's an amazing non-conscious pattern that she could find the people in the world and recreate her childhood patterns. That's why the non-conscious, most of the time it works just fine, except when it doesn't, and that's when we get involved. So Dr. Nordhoff, if, if the non-conscious is doing all this work, is it time that we really start to think of it as a resource rather than just this black box in the cockpit that we never think about and, uh, until we crash, as it were? Yes, certainly so. I mean, what our own investigations show is that apparently uh, any kind of spontaneous activity, and hence the unconscious in the brain, is somehow personally relevant. Uh, it's a close overlap between self-specific stimuli and the spontaneous activity in the brain. And obviously, when you're in early ages, in your very early ages, you encode in your spontaneous activity everything that is relevant to you. So it is no wonder that your early patterns in life, your early childhood pattern or maybe adolescent pattern, are much more strongly encoded and ingrained in the information pattern of your spontaneous activities than, let's say, the pattern you encode with 50. So that, I think, explains some of the uh, examples. And I do think that uh, we really have to listen to our spontaneous activity 
to our unconscious, how it continuously unfolds, or some of our colleagues say non-conscious, I think this is more a conceptual term. Uh, we really have to spontaneous listen as a resource which can tell us a lot about the person and the personality. And this is something I look for very often in my patients. I don't listen to so much what they actually say, but how they say things. And the way how they say things deeply reflects their unconscious. Hmm. And that uh, often provides a key for me as a psychiatrist and psychotherapist to understand my patients and then to offer uh, proper treatment. I see. All right, we should remind everybody that uh, the documentaries, one clip of which we've already seen, another clip of which we're about to see, are all available on a special website that we've created just for this week. It's called uh, tvo.org slash mysteries of the mind. So let's take a look at a second clip now. This is from the documentary Memory that aired immediately before us tonight. If you didn't see it, you can catch it on the website. Let's play a clip from that and then we'll come back and chat some more. Roll tape, please. You helped me when I was quite recently bereaved. Were you working with my memories? Yes, I was. Because what happened was, um, because of the, the trauma of Jack's death, you were quite naturally thinking about that. You were thinking about how he died. And that was running over and over in the forefront of your mind. And you weren't remembering how he lived. And without wishing to oversimplify it, what I did was I swapped the two round. And so at the forefront of your mind was all the wonderful times that you spent together. So now I know Paul really did move my memories around to alter how I felt. It just makes you realize how easily one can manipulate the brain. The way Paul described that, Dr. Gauss, where I just basically, right, made the shift, shifted some memories back here, others forward, it made it sound rather easy. Is it that easy to do? Well, certainly. And the reason why is because, you know, people uh, tend to not really process as quickly as we think we process. Because what happens at the deeper brain level uh, only comes to the executive or the frontal lobes uh, sometime later. And although it's only milliseconds, uh, it's, it's, it's like a, let's call it a photo shot, where there is this frame at that moment in time, and this moves. And then the second one comes, and they kind of overlap, but there's an in-between. And perhaps the best way where we can see how uh, easily people are influenced is in mass behavior. Uh, you know, if we watch, uh, for instance, uh, full material from the uh, Nuremberg rallies or some of the other political rallies that we see around the world, we see how people get taken up in that. Now, if that happens in the group, imagine what happens when it is one-on-one -on -one, uh, or what we see in cult movements where people's brains, in fact, are uh, very uh, susceptible to the inputs that they receive. Bill O'Hanlon, do we know why hypnosis works? We don't know precisely, no. It's, it's a little bit of one of the mysteries of the mind, but we know that it does work. Um, you know, we don't also know why lithium works so well for manic depression, but we still use it. And we're starting to, as Dr. Berlin said, now we have these tools to peer into the mind, which we didn't have. It was pretty much a black box, but we're finding the biology and the neurology of what actually happens. And I think we'll know very soon why hypnosis might work and where specifically it works and also how to make it more effective. Heather Berlin, uh, what's your view on hypnosis? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of ideas here. I, uh, some studies show that, for example, um, the way a memory is repressed is that actually the prefrontal cortex um, increases its activation and it deactivates parts of the brain that are involved in memory, such as the hippocampus, to keep that memory outside of awareness. So one idea is that part of what's happening in hypnosis is that, so to speak, you know, Freud would say you're lowering your defenses, but actually in dream states or states of hypnosis or even some types of meditation, you're actually decreasing the activation of the prefrontal cortex. Therefore, perhaps releasing that memory that was previously suppressed by the prefrontal cortex, allowing it to, say, rise to the level of consciousness, and then 
then restructuring it, manipulating it, because all of our memories are very malleable, as we know from flawed eyewitness testimony. So if you can, in a sense, do whatever technique you can to release that, that memory that's been otherwise suppressed, and then kind of rework it and reintegrate it into the system in a more uh, positive way, that could be one thing that's happening in psychotherapy. Another thing that we're starting to look at now is putting together a study where you can actually scan two people at the same time and look at their interaction. So normally with fMRI, people are in, alone in the scanner, but if you can scan two people and see what's happening in that dynamic situation, we can better understand what's happening in sort of the space between two people during psychotherapy. Uh, Dr. Nordhoff, for, for lack of a better expression, are you sold on the benefits of hypnosis? I think it's certainly a very valuable technique. And let me just add to the um, prefrontal cortex. You have to distinguish between medial and lateral uh, parts of the prefrontal cortex. And the medial parts of the prefrontal cortex show very high spontaneous activity and a lot of uh, spontaneous activity changes. And it seems that the balance between medial and lateral, between the middle of the prefrontal cortex and the outer parts, that they seem to mediate the balance between internal inputs from the body and the brain and external inputs from the environment. And this balance between internal and external seems to be shifted during uh, hypnosis and that in turn releases some of the neuronal or psychic energy which then probably makes it possible to better work with some of the former traumatic memories which then might be released. So I think this internal external balance, this is something what we observe in our patients as well as in healthy subjects, to be central for the um, kind of contents in consciousness, whether you have more your own internal and mental and past contents, or whether you're more focused on the external contents uh, going on in the environment. Okay, so hypnosis is one way to access all of that. Uh, Bill O'Hanlon, are there other ways to access or engage with the non-conscious mind? Well, yes, I think that, again, your whole week is about changing the brain by changing the interactions. And what Dr. Northrop just told us is, I think people who get more functional interact with the world in a different way. They don't interact on those old patterns, like my friend who would flinch when she made a mistake on the piano. She starts to update to the current context. And I think that that's where we can work with the unconscious is by using this brain plasticity to change old patterns, to update them so the person is now in the present rather than reliving the past again and again. And what are the implications for this? Let's, let's um, take it a step beyond uh, and, and use a more serious example than not to say the example of your friend who played the piano wasn't serious, but yeah. let's say you're suffering from, from you know, a really traumatic mental illness. What, what does all of what we've been talking about so far have in terms of the implications of treating mental illness? Well, I think, again, that the hope these days is that people's brain can change. When I first, and I think most of my colleagues that are on this panel, when I first learned about the brain, it was very flexible in adolescence and before, but afterwards in adult life, it wasn't very flexible. And now mm -hmm. we're learning with the new tools how changeable it is and what we have to do in psychotherapy and in other ways is give people new experiences that can change their brains and change the non-conscious automatic patterns that keep playing themselves out and that's when we give them life experience and psychotherapy experience and neurological changes with medications and sti electric stimulation of the brain. I think we're on the verge of really being able to help people change in a way that we never had before. Hmm. Dr. Berlin, could I get you to weigh in on what you think the implications for our understanding mental illness are as a result of the things we've talked about tonight? Oh, I, I think it's huge. I mean, the, well, again, uh, uh, just to reinstantiate, the more we understand about the workings of the brain, the better these certain kinds of talk therapy therapies will be, because we'll, they'll know how to, I think, uh, target them to uh, work with certain mental functions that can perhaps, for example, increase prefrontal or executive function if we understand that that's part of a problem of a disorder, let's say. Um, then once we understand the neural circuitry better of these disorders, then we can go in and target them with specific treatments, whether it be with electrodes and things like deep brain stimulation that they're using for depression now and we're doing trials for obsessive compulsive disorder, or whether it be with uh, pharmaceutical drugs or just certain types of therapies. But the more we understand about how these unconscious processes are 
working at the neural level, the better we'll be able to uh, target treatments towards them. And Dr. Berlin, is it, uh, I don't know if you can say this, but do you favor one type of treatment, generically speaking, over another? No, I think that each individual, I mean, treatment or psychiatry or psychotherapy is an art and it's a matter of sort of trial and error and trying certain things work for certain people and others don't and it's and not every brain is the same and everybody also is born with a certain genetic predisposition towards certain types of temperament and personality traits like something like a personality disorder is actually very difficult to treat and it tends to be pervasive throughout a lifetime because certain things we have evolution or evolved to have certain biological predispositions that could be maladaptive um, so I, I think it's important to remember that each individual is different and you can only work with the person within their particular biological constraints whether it be because of the, the way the brain is structured or certain chemical imbalances they might have but there's no kind of one answer fits all understood uh, Jacques Gauss what, uh, what what's your hope in terms of what we've been talking about today and how that might lead you to be able to do what you do better more effectively and so on well I, I think you know uh, if I have to summarize what uh, we've all said on this panel is the brain is another organ and um, if we think of it as an organ like a muscle if we exercise it it will go in a certain direction and as we've become aware of diseases of other organs of the body we are now beginning to understand the diseases of the brain as well and mental health and uh, mental illness, I think, is uh, in fact a disease of the brain. Uh, and uh, depending on how we approach it, and I think the multidisciplinary approach is, is, is certainly indicated, it's not one thing that fixes it, but it's the combination of things. And I think this is where, we, where we're going. And I'm really excited because I think uh, we are on the threshold of, of great breakthroughs, great understandings, and certainly uh, helping people to help themselves to make their brains better and healthier. In which case, Dr. Nordhoff, do you want, uh, we, we talk about physiotherapy right now really being only for the body. Do you see a future where we talk about physiotherapy for the mind? Oh yeah, certainly so. I'm a big, big proponent of physiotherapy and in many of my acute inpatients, uh, let's say with depression or schizophrenia, if they're so acute, they're, you cannot approach them psychologically, but I approach them with physiotherapy. And that usually somehow frees their mind of all these psychological obsessive thoughts they have. And also it grounds them in the body and ultimately it will make it uh, more easier for them to update their thoughts and all their mental activity, including their emotions and cognitions from the environment. Um, one of these other uh, colleagues said that exactly the problem is that some of these mental disorders, uh, people save from a deficit in updating, that they cannot properly adapt to their respective environmental context. And that's uh, much more easier uh, if they uh, start with physiotherapy and that in turn might, as I just hypo uh, hypothetically assume, might provide some metabolic uh, energy from the body to the brain, which then makes it easier for the brain to reorganize uh, its circuits. But that's something we don't know. But certainly physiotherapy is therapy of the mind. Hmm. That's my strong conviction. Okay. Bill O'Hanlon, let me paint this picture for you and then let me get your uh, view on this. If the non-conscious turns out to be doing a lot more work than we had originally anticipated, and given how complicated the society we live in today is, do you worry about overloading the, the non-conscious part of our minds and what that could portend? I worry more about l overloading the conscious parts of our mind with all the stimulation that we have around all the advertising, all the video games, all the televisions, and all that kind of stuff because then you don't have that part to, uh, you know, as Dr. Northrup said, update your your life you know you have the the classic picture of the family that's traveling in the minivan and they're all in their electronic devices not actually seeing things or the <laughs> story i heard that a lot of people go to the grand canyon and they never actually see the grand canyon because they're looking through <laughs> their screens and their iphones or their cameras and they never actually see it and i i worry much more that we're shortchanging the conscious mind because we only have a certain amount of conscious attention and energy, and that I think we're not encoding new things because we're not letting that unconscious or non-conscious learn new things and update. 
that's my, more my worry. Heather Berlin, you want to weigh in on that? Um, I mean, as far as the influence of technology on the brain, I think we just don't know yet what the effects are going to be. Uh, I do agree that, I, I mean, we just know from mental health benefits that, let's so say for a cure for depression, that some people just walking in nature um, a few times a week has been shown to improve the symptoms of depression. And part of that could be, yes, getting fresh air and getting exercise, but also just taking a break from all of this stimulation mm -hmm. that's constantly flooding the brain. Uh, begin, again, because it takes work to filter out the information, to decide what's important. Uh, and the more we can sort of give ourselves a mental break, whether it be through meditation or just going through a walk in nature, I think the better uh, for just this, our psychic health. Jacques Gauss, do you worry about the uh, overloading of the non-conscious mind? Oh, absolutely, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we've lost touch with our origins. We've lost touch with being human. Uh, we, we don't see nature anymore. We don't experience nature anymore. Uh, and and uh, I think Bo made a very strong point there, you know, that people aren't seeing the Grand Canyon because they're so busy looking at it through their, <laughs> through their cell phones or their uh, uh, video cameras. Uh, and that's where we miss out. Uh, people don't talk to each other. People don't connect with each other anymore, which is a really, really important part uh, because most of our connection is now with, you know, tip tapping and uh, mm -hmm. emailing. And that has an implication for the non-conscious mind. Absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. because we're losing a vital connection, which is that which makes us uniquely human and connected to other human beings and to nature. So not right now, but at some point, turn the TV off for a while. Oh, but absolutely. not right now. Not right now. Okay. okay. Not right now. <laughs> Under understand that. No, okay. Uh, let's do, we got a couple of minutes left here, and let me try this. Um, Georg Nortoff, if we were to have this conversation in 10 years, what would you tell me today that you hope you know or are able to do 10 years from now that you can't do right now? Um, provide much better insight into the spatial and temporal features of our spontaneous activity of the brain and how it is malleable to change by the environment. Hmm. And I think that our, that I think in the technology to tap into that, we currently don't have that. We don't know. We always have to use certain stimuli or tasks to measure the spontaneous activity in the brain. And I do think that there we can find some of the key to the unconscious and ultimately also to the conscious and also our sense of self. Bill O'Hanlon, how would you answer that? I would say, you know, that what, uh, what we'll be doing in 10 years is a little less art and a lot more science will know more targeted and specifically what works for different problems and what helps people change as we peer more into the brain and learn more about how it works underneath the hood. And Dr. Heather Berlin, your answer. I mean, I'd love to understand or know what the neural basis of consciousness really is, um, how to distinguish it from the neural basis of unconscious processes, and then to determine whether, for example, you know, does, does your iPhone have consciousness? Does the internet have consciousness? You know, can it be instantiated in a non-biological um, uh, object? So uh, understanding what the neural basis of consciousness is and who can possess it. Does a baby have it? Does it have it in utero? You know, I'd love to be able to answer these types of questions, which will, of course, lead to better treatments for psychiatric illness as well. So uh, that would be exciting if that could happen in the next 10 years, or at least in my lifetime. Heather, did you see the movie Her? No, you but really, I, I plan to. <laughs> you really have to. Give, Did they evolve what, to be a, well, a that's greater it. being I mean, than we are? Given what you just said about you'd like to know about whether or not your iPhone has consciousness of some kind, that's what that movie's about. It's about a, people who yeah. fall in love with their it's operating amazing. systems, and their operating systems have a spirit and a life and a consciousness, and it's, it's a fascinating look at... Um, well, actually, it's some of the things we're talking about today. Uh, okay. There's uh, only one conundrum, though. You have to ask ahead. it if it's conscious, and you don't know whether to believe it or not. So. <laughs> Very good point. Okay, folks, that's our time today. Thanks so much for joining us. And can I just say um, uh, to you, Heather Berlin, uh, uh, some people will know your mother-in-law. So let's just say that um, Joyce Murray, who came second to Justin Trudeau in the Liberal leadership race, the <laughs> Member of Parliament from Vancouver Quadra, is your mother-in-law, whom you just yep. made a grandmother. So congratulations yes, two did. months ago on you having <laughs> your child, and we thank you for joining us on TVO tonight, along with thank Bill O'Hanlon and Georg Nortoff and uh, Jacques Gauss here in our studio. Thanks so much, everybody, for a truly fascinating hour of television tonight on TVO.
Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.